everyone, and welcome back to How China Works. I am Ying Ying Li, your co-host. Our other host, Brandon Davis, will join us shortly here. My mission is to enhance cross-cultural communications related to China. And Brandon is a writer and producer who uses his travels to tell better stories. And together, we produce this show to bring you China talk that you won't hear anywhere else. Today, I'm coming to you from a quick vacation in Bangkok, and Brendan is in Los Angeles. But last week, we both were having a call with today's guest and had a great conversation. If you are new to the show, our goal with season two of How China Works is to bring you conversations with leading thinkers, people who can help with our mission of fostering cross-cultural conversations. Especially related to helping Chinese youth stretching their wings and going global, and today's guest gets us off to the best start imaginable. We are very grateful and pleased to welcome Professor Kerry Brown, who will join us on the call from London. Professor Brown's resume related to China is extensive, and he is very searchable online. But we will include a few links in our show notes to help you get started if you want to learn more. Brandon will have a few things after the interview to wrap us up, but we had a great talk, and we want to get into it. So now, please enjoy our interview with Professor Kerry Brown. Well, we are very happy to be here today with our very first guest on season two. We have Professor Kerry Brown. Professor Brown, how are you today? I'm very well, thank you. Excellent. And、uh, Ying Ying Li is in China. I'm in Los Angeles, and Professor Brown is in、uh, London, I do believe. Well, our very first question for you today is a fairly general one. Could you please give us the short bio on you? If you meet someone new and you want to really sum yourself up in twenty or thirty seconds for them, and they have not had the pleasure of meeting you yet, how do you introduce yourself to people in a professional context these days? Okay, so I'm the professor of Chinese studies and the director of the Lao China Institute at King's College London. Prior to that, I was professor of Chinese politics and director of the China Studies Centre at the University of Sydney. And then before that, I was the、uh, head of the Asia program at Chatham House, a think tank in London. And then before that, from about 1998 onwards, I was a member of the British Foreign Office. And then even before that, I lived in China for a couple of years, and I've lived in China in all about about six years. Uh, and I've visited probably about a hundred times now, so China has been a pretty central part of my life. That's great. So, with that being said, Professor Brown, I have really our audience, including myself, will really like to know、uh, your why at the first place for choosing China as such a lifelong object to study and engage with. Well, I think like most big choices in life, it was totally accidental. I didn't do、oh. Chinese at university. I did、uh, English literature, and then I went to Japan for a year. There was a scheme in the early 1990s, which I still think runs the Japan Exchange Teachers. Although there wasn't any exchange because no Japanese teachers came to Britain, as far as I know. So <laughs> I went and I taught in Japan,、um, and then went to China because it wasn't easy to go to China then in 1990 for the first time, and just felt an affinity. So I think the only、um, Real sort of、uh, the the only、uh, kind of rationale for this I can ever think of is that in a previous life I must have been a Chinese peasant or something because I've always <laughs> felt at home in China.、Uh, but apart from that,、uh, no other reason. I and and since 1990, one way or the other, China has been a significant part of my life. Why do you、oh. think that it's got such a such a connection? When, once you actually made the contact, you, can you track back to what it was that really got its hooks in you? I think because China is a very connected society,、uh, people go from their connections with each other, and that makes it very human. And you know, the society I'd come from wasn't really like that. More institutions and less sort of personal connections. And of course, that's criticised, and people say there's too much personal connections in China. But I always found it, on one level, very human. You know, that you, you made. Contact with people, and it wasn't difficult to make friends. And sometimes it was too easy to make friends. You know, the、uh, kind of joke was: you spent your first six months in China making friends, and your next eighteen months trying to avoid them. So, <laughs> so. <laughs> um, but I, I mean, I, I think also Chinese,、um, you know, humor, sense of humor is quite visual, and that's pretty similar to the British sense of humor. And I think.、Um, You, you know, so there were kind of other affinities rather than just the, the, 
the personal, the, the, the sort of the way the society is. But I always found it a place I felt very much at home in. That's very interesting. We mentioned in our previous talks that you find Chinese humor is quite unique, right? We definitely have chance to talk about that in a later episodes if we have chance. And you have been a professor for um, students worldwide, especially.、Uh, I mean, you probably have been engaged with thousands, if not.、Um, Millions with students so far, especially for Chinese students. You have a program right now, right?、Um, teaching Chinese to be future global leaders or something like that. Can you just give、yeah. us a little bit more detail about that? Yeah. So the institute I direct, we have about thirty-five postgraduates、uh, and about thirty PhD students、uh, every year.、And、so the postgraduate course is probably half from China, and then the、mm -hmm. other. A、uh, group from Russia, from Europe, from America, from Taiwan, from all sorts of different places. Australia, we've had, so it is pretty international. I suppose because we're multidisciplinary, that's attractive. It's not just looking at Chinese language or Chinese politics or Chinese economy. We do all sorts of things from environment to political economy to society, anthropology, and even try and do some hard science in the science、uh, in in the environment module. So we try and cover a huge range of issues, and you're right. Education and literacy about China, about Asia, but about China in particular, is in desperate need of improvement in the UK. I looked at the statistic yesterday, and there's、mm -hmm. only 260 people going into China studies each year in the UK、wow. at undergraduate level. So that really needs to improve. New enrolments each year has actually gone down. So it really needs to improve, and quite quickly. What would you say are some of the main concerns of your Chinese、um, students? You know, what what are what are they looking ahead as the challenges that they especially want to tackle in the、uh, you know short to near the near to medium term? Well, they are incredible people because they're global citizens, but of course they are Chinese, so they're very related to their home environments, and they have all sorts of pressures on them. It's not. Cheap to come and study in the UK.、Mm. It's not cheap. It's、mm -hmm. not cheap to go and study abroad, basically anywhere in Europe or America. So it's a big investment, and many of them aren't from very wealthy backgrounds. They're from modest or normal backgrounds. So it's a big investment, and for their futures, of course, like any other young cohort, there's all sorts of uncertainties and doubts. Some of them interested in business. Some of them want to go into government. Some of them want to go into think tanks. Some of them want even want. You know, God help them to go into academia. So、uh, it's a very big <laughs> area.、Um, I guess I'm always very impressed by their commitment and their energy and、uh, the fact that they're incredibly disciplined. And not just the Chinese, all of the students at King. So I remember, and we can all probably remember our student lives. And、uh, you know, a lot of the time you're just sort of daydreaming, or you know, which is nice <laughs> and good. But I, I think that they they really have lean timetables. They they go really on on very very tight schedules, and that's certainly not something I remember from my student days. So I, I am impressed by that. that they're so almost professional, even though they're just you know the very beginning of their careers. So, Professor Brown, among the students in your class, in your groups, there,、um, I heard you mention that half of them, at least, are Chinese students. Are there any differences between them with、uh, other international students, let's say students from UK, who actually study about this China program?、Uh, when it comes to like start studying habits or the vision. Or the hope,、uh, any kind of plans for the future? The, any any difference? Well, Chinese students have a huge mountain to climb because of the language difference, and even the very best of them, it's a big, big thing. I mean, if I were to do a degree in Chinese in China, it would be really, really challenging. And I've been trying to sort of, you know, speak and master Chinese for over you know twenty five years. So it's incredibly impressive that they achieve what they do achieve. To do really, really well, like anywhere, is not easy.、Uh, are there differences? The only difference, I suppose, is that there is a huge、uh, distinction between the kind of education environment they come from in China, where it is very teacher-centered, and the teacher is the source of all knowledge. It's very Confucian in some ways, the way that teachers are central to learning. 
and of course the western traditions are certainly the ones in the uk where it's more of a dialogue it's more about exploring issues and the teacher can sometimes uh, frequently if it's me does have to admit that they're totally wrong <laughs> and so you have this very very different kind of, uh, you know teacher pupil relationship the power hierarchy if you want to call it that is not the same as in china and i think you know often i have particularly phd students at the beginning yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. look and say what's the answer and I have to let them into the big secret that there is no answer and uh, <laughs> they're gonna, there's going to be any answer they're going to be the ones finding it not me I mean right. it's not a function so I think it's it's a very different sort of uh, educational pedagogical sort of environment to, to, to be in for them that's a big challenge right right um, I'm sure there are a lot of fun experience that working with uh, uh, students all of all over the world, especially Chinese students over the air as well, when it comes to the cross-cultural differences. So uh, last time we also mentioned about, you know, and the Chinese students all globally. Um, actually, in our previous How China Works season one shows, I mentioned to you last time, we have several episodes focused on telling stories Chinese youth going global, which actually is a big, big part um, in our podcast. We want to really foster this um, hope and also leadership when it comes to Chinese telling better stories and Chinese youth being able to tell better stories to the world. So with your great, great experience engaging with, um, you know, not just uh, students in China, but also outside of China, Oh, let's say generally young people, what do you find other successful examples that um, when it comes to better presenting China in a global arena, if there's any, um, if uh, what are the uh, successful examples that you have seen or what actually are the factors contributing to the success of it? Well, the whole story of Chinese going abroad after 1978, when I guess the process really started. I mean, I know in the early 20th century, there are a lot of Chinese that did go abroad and go to Japan and some to Europe, some to America. Uh, that that was significant. But this is the sort of second phase. and It's been far, far bigger and very dramatic. So I guess the main groups have been students and then business people. And their stories are not known. It's weird that you've got all sorts of films and novels and other mm -hmm. things about, you know, British people or Europeans going to China. Um, you don't really have the same about Chinese coming to Britain and the experiences they've gone through. And I was watching a film last week, An Elephant Sits Down, about li life in China, an incredible film, uh, four hours long, by a young director who unfortunately uh, committed suicide, a young um, Hu Bo, uh, you know, kind of young guy right. who uh, was only 29. And this is an incredible film about mm. daily life for students in China. It's pretty harsh. I mean, it's, it's not an easy film yeah. to watch. Uh, and I was thinking about how you could do a similar kind of thing for sort of the life of Chinese students coming to Europe um, mm -hmm. because it's not easy. I mean, when you arrive, it's disorientating. You've got to find your networks. Many of them have a very tough time and those stories have never really been heard. It's kind of happened under our noses. When I say our, I mean people like me or people who, who live in Britain. I, I've noticed it because I've known a lot of these students, right. but a lot of people, um, in universities, even quite, quite close to this story, don't really see it. I mean, you've suddenly, from 20 years ago to today, you've got this new group of people who have never figured in our lives before. And yeah. we don't know anything about their stories. They haven't told their stories. We, we know if you go on WeChat and you have a connection with a lot of these students, you can hear some of their stories. So I hear echoes mm -hmm. of those stories. But I've never really seen anyone try and treat it in a more systematic way and really look at how they have changed. I mean, the only thing I'd say about this whole story, I'm not I'm talking about business people now, it's a separate story. But I think for Chinese students um, who've come here um, and America and elsewhere, the one thing you can really say is it's made their worldview more complicated. It has not made them, uh, you know, diehard supporters of westernization. It's not made them diehard supporters of their home environment. Uh, it's made them more complicated. And they're complicated whether they stay in, you know, the West or they go back to China. That complexity stays. And I don't see a lot of 
attempts to really tell that story because I think it's kind of happened. Uh, it's happening. It will continue to happen, but we've mm-hmm. never really noticed it. And I think someone's going to come along one day and tell that story, and it will be an extraordinary one to tell. It's quite, you know, an amazingly important story. Well, that actually is something I'd love to follow up on. I we have talked again in, in our show previous um, to to this, where we were discussing, you know, what the future might be like, and one of one of the themes that's come up a few times in in various language is this idea of what is what's next what's the evolution of how people deal with each other so it's one thing to understand history and it's it's another thing to understand different cultures and how to integrate and play well you know amongst cultures but it seems like we're heading toward this you know as the world gets smaller thanks to technology in so many ways we're heading into this new uncharted land i mean do you do you see that those students you're mentioning, you know, they're having to learn a new culture? Um, you know, are you getting a sense that they're going to invent something we haven't seen before or that they're, do you have any sense of that? Are they, are they just going to shuck it off when they go back home or are they actually going to maybe combine this and create a new third thing? Well, the sheer numbers, I think from 1978, initially slowly and now a huge number uh, there's been about three and a half million Chinese students go abroad and study, and that there probably are half have returned to China, mm-hmm. uh, maybe more now, and half have stayed elsewhere. And so that's a big number. That's a significant number, and particularly because it's a highly educated, highly mobile, and in some areas, incredibly influential group. And they're only at the beginning of their impact. So I, I'm almost certain it's going to be a new thing that they create i mean Mm -hmm. there's no template that this fits into because there's no case of a country sending its elite abroad or its potential elite abroad to study and come back Mm -hmm. uh, at this scale so this is this is new there's no uh you know kind of template that's existing for this now i guess it's going to be uh a kind of combination of the place that these people say find for themselves in China. And that's not an easy Mm -hmm. place because many that have gone back have not found it easy, Uh, but they're starting to appear in government and business and elsewhere and be very significant. Um, And then those who have settled outside of China and the impact they have. And that really depends in some places they've been highly integrated and others they have come across all sorts of challenges um, from being regarded with suspicion to being regarded as the sort of main bridge to China. I mean, it's been a huge education for all of us to try and work out the place of this group. So this is going to be quite a new uh, developing and dynamic story, uh, but it will have a significant impact. If China is going to be the major economy of the world from now to the future, and that seems pretty clear, no matter whether it goes badly or you know well, it's going to be an enormous influence. This group are hugely important in that story. Uh, they're the bridge, and they're just working out what role they want to play at the moment. Um, the other thing I'd have to say about this group is they are not the same gender kind of uh, composition as um, you, you know the standard elite that you get in China. I, I imagine mm-hmm. there's more women than men. Uh, in my students, there's more women than men. And if you go and look at you know, the power structures in China, it's usually more men mm-hmm. than women. So I suspect that that is also going to have a huge impact because an investment by families into their children, and often mm-hmm. it's a girl that has come abroad, is still going to be enormously you know, important for their futures. The old kind of uh, attitude this sort of confusion attitude of you know the kind of boys and the males are the ones that matter most mm-hmm. i think that's dead mm-hmm. i mean it yeah. died a while ago but it's certainly dead now and so you have this hugely important new elite who are pretty much 50 50 male female uh they're very diverse in terms of their kind of views their attitudes and that is, you know, where does that fit in the story of China, which I don't think is an easy thing to predict at the moment. But it's got to fit because they offer too much. You can't ignore them. You can't just invest in this enormous group and then expect them to sort of just disappear. That's not going to happen. So I would really watch it very closely. It's a hugely important story. Echoing with what Professor mm-hmm. Brown just mentioned mm-hmm. about telling better Chinese stories with film, with better themes, 
and the spirit of Chinese people and the Chinese student working hard as the Chinese people, as a Chinese student, that I had this um, relentless <laughs> experience of working for my Gaokao. And mm. I really can resonate with that. And it's incredibly, incredibly competitive. And um, that is uh, one big part of, made of Chinese uh, made one big part here in Chinese society that drives Chinese people just relentlessly working hard and mm. is still is still in some way dominating the, you know the the key uh, ambition here right so when it comes to how to be better how to build a better life this so-called Lu Qi Xiu Zi Jia Yu Gan on this particular slogan um, by uh, President Xi, I believe that it's um, also so much everywhere here in China, all over the world. But will this uh, particular spirit drive China? Um, I mean, for the Chinese students, they know they have to work very, very hard, but working hard um, will get them somewhere they want. And from your perspective, like how could this, because from some in a very different cultures, they value different things when it comes to um, success and success in life. So I was wondering how could this different dynamics, different cultures could sit down or some way just having dialogues when it comes to showcasing the cultures. I presume that some of this huge group of people will be doing the kind of things you're doing. Uh, which is to you know, try and create a bridge. Um, right. I, I mean, and to sort of be ambassadors, not just for their country politically, but uh, for their country in terms of trying to explain its culture. I mean, you know, the issue is that we have a, a, a knowledge asymmetry. Um, we, uh, the, when I say we, I mean Europeans, North Americans, Australians, that, that sort of group. Um, so the world's major kind of uh, economies apart from China and India uh, have been uh, you know kind of parasitical in a way on China coming and learning about them and they haven't really done a huge amount of trying to learn about China and this group of students in a sense is a wonderful resource to try and do that but it's not happening at the moment not in the way that it needs to happen uh, because you, you can't really tap into that sort of knowledge source without a way better structure of trying to do it. And so what I suspect is going to happen or need to happen is that we need to work out better ways of learning from students that come here rather than just saying that we're teaching them. It's not mm-hmm. the way that it should happen. It's got to be much more dynamic. And I think when you think of how the disparity is how big the gap is between the knowledge of university students in China even those who don't go abroad about the West broadly and the knowledge of Western students about China I mean it's a big imbalance uh, mm-hmm. um, you know we would not and, and I mean I can understand in the past because China was relatively marginal until quite recently that people regarded it as a specialist area you know if you studied Chinese in the 80s or 90s when I was uh, starting, it was really esoteric. Mm-hmm. It was kind mm-hmm. of quite a mysterious thing to do. And um, when you think that from that time to this time, the change is so huge because China is so significant as a part of our economic and also our political lives and geopolitical lives, then this attitude that it's an esoteric and difficult issue, you know, and that it's only for an elite to learn about China has got to change. We need, mm-hmm. you know, People mm-hmm. in schools to know a lot more about China and the way that Chinese on the whole, I get the impression, I mean, I might be wrong, but I get the impression that in their main curricula, they will learn about European culture and they will learn about European literature and language. And I believe that Chinese now have to learn a foreign language from the age of seven or eight. I mean, in the UK, you don't have to learn a foreign language, period. Mm-hmm. So it's a sort of huge difference. And, th- and I think that mentality is something that we can learn from. Uh, I'm not saying that China has the solutions to everything in terms of this sort of education. I mean, a lot of people go to China and say, oh, the way that they teach maths is amazing and the way they teach science is amazing. And yet, of course, there's only been one Nobel Prize in these areas. Mm-hmm. Ever. So, mm-hmm. you know, there's I think there are um, certainly things that 
the West is still very, very good at, but there's an enormous amount that we need to do to learn about um, this important country that's just been very, very neglected, except by a small group of, of, of elite. And, and students can play a big role in that. Chinese students can be teachers in that rather than just come here and, uh, you know, be, be those that are taught. I'm interested, what do you see as, you know, the, the your top two or three primary challenges uh, as the world order sort of shifts around related to China specifically? I mean, what's what's just, I mean, I guess some of these are probably obvious for a lot of us, but I'm curious what's on your mind as far as the big things to really be paying attention to beyond just the immediate, like, you know, the, the news cycle or something like that. Well, I guess we're working out at the moment through things like Belt and Road and other ideas, what a world run on Chinese values might look like. And mm -hmm. it's different. And I think the main difference is that the Chinese value system is quite diverse. I mean, there's no unifying worldview. Uh, at heart, Europeans and Americans have come from broadly a sort of fairly unified worldview. I mean, a kind of Judaic Christian sort of view of the world, although I completely understand there's huge diversity now. And the kind of average European and American probably lives in a very different sort of world than the one that these ideas originally came from. But at, at heart, it wasn't um, as diverse as that of China. So when you've got a kind of uh, sort of intellectual and uh, thought tradition in China of, you know, Confucianism, Taoism, Buddhism, and a lot of other kind of folk religions, I mean, the things that Ian Johnson wrote about in his book on religions in China, I mean, mm -hmm. recently, um, you you can kind of see there's a very big difference. There's a sort of worldview which is fairly hybrid and can accept a lot of kind of you know it's very pragmatic and that's what we see with the way that chinese think and have thought in the last 40 years and a western view which is often accused of being universalizing and now mm -hmm. we're in this kind of extraordinary moment where you can't kind of see an easy boundary between these two it's not like we can march around the world saying well china stays within its space and we're in our space and that's cool actually it's um we're in each other's spaces we're in each other's exactly. spaces and yeah. uh you know an example would be uh, a friend of mine who works for a major uh, legal company and you know international law for companies means if you kind of sort of succeed in getting a license to do something somewhere then it's got international validity and so perversely, uh, Chinese companies can get, you know, judgments in the UK or America that then restrict what they can do in China because they're international. And if they want the protection of those licenses internationally, they have to observe them in their home territory. Right. And that's incredibly difficult for Chinese companies to work out. I mean, how can that be that your international obligations restrict what you can do domestically? Mm -hmm. uh, but that's just the law. I mean, you can either accept it or walk away from it. Uh, and it's difficult because their international work is as important now as their domestic work. So it's an amazing kind of quandary. And I think you can see this sort of in all sorts of different areas that, you know, Western companies that want to work in China realize that does impact on the way they behave elsewhere. So this is an extraordinary moment of a cross fertilization. It's not particularly easy. It, it's probably going to be pretty um, challenging at times, but it's unavoidable. It's pretty unavoidable. Yeah, I guess the enhancing enhancing cross-cultural law awareness is super relevant, super important with the, today's geopolitical moving forward, <laughs> geopolitical oh. political situations. And uh, going coming back to the key specific topic that I'm most most curious about at this moment is uh, for. Um, Chinese youth going global still, what are the tools or resources or any kind of opportunities that Professor Brown, you find that are most effective at this moment in helping those um, uh, young people like in their post 80s, post 90s, or even younger generation, when they are actually saying they are most, this group are most individualistic uh, than ever in Chinese history, probably you can see that, right? And uh, what, what would be the the most obvious um, basic resources or tools um, they can find effective in helping them embracing the world diversity and being able to present them in the world arena? Well, we come back to what we talked about earlier, which is stories. I mean, mm -hmm. they obviously need to know the story that they're part of. And that isn't entirely clear at the moment. And that's something that any Chinese student needs to work out. Are they a story about an aspirational country that is going to, you know, really be a major global player? Or are they a story about 
trying to transform their country back, you know, where they came from. This is a story about creating a new sort of hybrid future where we all live in one environment mm-hmm. and change and share with each other. Um, I mean, I think what is lacking uh, the tools, I guess, they are acquiring or have acquired intellectually. But uh, the sort of thing, I guess, is the silence of this group is only really solved by there being uh, some kind of uh, spokesperson or some kind mm-hmm. of product that mm-hmm. means people can engage with it. Um, mm-hmm. If you think of, um, you know, kind of in the past, Britain didn't really understand India that well. And then a group of Indian writers, mm-hmm. uh, Salman Rushdie and people like that, appeared who told the story of India and it became part of English literature and I think it really helped Mm -hmm. and it's made our thinking about India way more complicated Um, and I think for China it's much more difficult because China didn't have the same kind of relationship with the you know Great Britain that uh, India did Uh, and certainly with America it's much more difficult but I guess you you know you think of writers like Chou Xiaolong um, you know the Mm -hmm. detective detective, uh, Chen writer um, Mm -hmm. I think his work is really helpful because it makes Chinese very human. It's like, you know, wow, it's amazing that there are things like detectives in China and that they're actually kind of pretty human. Mm-hmm. Um, he doesn't, you know, we, we have this image of China outside sometimes that is intimidating and scary. It's either uh, very esoteric and very mysterious. It's either, mm-hmm. you know, kind of terrifying and, you know, full of police agents and people like this. And of course, <laughs> No, that is true. I mean, when you go to China, you you see a whole complexity of things. That's not, I mean, what, you know, it's if it, if there's any truth in it, it's a tiny, tiny part of this bigger truth. Mm-hmm. So I suppose, you know, I'm waiting for the time when one of these um, students uh, has the sort of big moment when they write the kind of great novel of the Chinese experience of being an international you know, uh, actor, you know, a, a Chinese student. If you think... Um, in the 1920s and 30s of figures like Lao Shu, you know, the, the great writer right. who very mm-hmm. tragically then went to China and I, think, I mean, uh, committed suicide in the Cultural Revolution. But he, he was sort of representative of someone who kind of nearly found a voice in mm-hmm. the West. Um, when you go to Cambridge, um, you know, you, you see this so Xu Zhimuo, you know, the kind of mm-hmm. poet that it seems to me interesting that there's this enormous sort of Chinese interest when they go to Cambridge and seeing the place where Xu Zhimuo wrote his his poetry and he's a very famous figure in china a tragic figure and yet no one in cambridge really knows much about this guy you know i mean it's it's mm. weird and, and i guess we probably need um a kind of figure who writes mm-hmm. in english like the indian kind of writers did that right. makes china familiar in the mainstream sort of and, and makes this story of chinese students familiar uh, because then it becomes recognized too vast at the moment. I mean, how can you make sense of you know, a billion separate stories? But if you've got someone who kind of captures the drama of that story uh, mm-hmm. and tells it in a way that is um, recognizable and that can be emotionally sort of accessible, that's right. really... I mean, the problem of the Chinese story is it's emotionally inaccessible to a lot of Westerners. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's mm-hmm. big. This that's is the big dirty secret. Sometimes. <laughs> yeah, it, it's it's really really strange. It's like <laughs> we uh, we have sort of created this otherness about China that is really hard to penetrate and emotionally engaging mm-hmm. with China, which I think is it, it's the most indif- that's the most difficult thing to do. And and why not? Because of course it's a human story, but it's still mm-hmm. uh, pretty inaccessible to a lot of a lot of non Chinese. Right. Do you, think, do you think it'll probably be someone who is perhaps a foreign-born Chinese person who will who will be this bridge? I mean, somebody who has who is more open to the outside culture. I mean, I think that story has been dealt with because I mean, foreign-born Chinese. Um, you know, there's been novelists in the past. I'm trying to remember the uh, 1980s, the novelist who um, wrote the uh, the Joy Lock Club. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, Xi Xi Fu Hui, I guess. Yeah. Um, Jun Chang, who wrote Wild Swans, I suppose, isn't mm-hmm. it? I mean, so she was born in China, in Sichuan. And, I mean, she, um, in a sense, Wild Swans, actually, Wild Swans is a good example of what um, what could be done now. I mean, that was very early. That was in the early 1990s. It was hugely successful. And I mm-hmm. guess of all the books that have structured or shaped, uh, you know, foreign understanding of China, 
I mean, that's been one of the most successful. Um, but that is a pretty bleak story. I mean, it's a pretty sort of tough story of, you know, this terrible regime that everyone kind of can't stand. And I think that story now is no longer so straightforward. I mean, for young Chinese coming, right. they don't have that memory. They don't have that memory of, you know, the Cultural Revolution. They have a very different world they're talking about. So we need an update of the wild spots, right. basically. We need an well, update. <laughs> well, right. it's, got, it's got to be time to tell, to tell the new stories, too, because the world's yeah. changing so fast. <laughs> you know, we're, we're in such a dramatically different place than we were just, you know, three, five years ago. Absolutely. Exactly. Exactly. And Professor Brown touched the essence of uh, communication or storytelling here. That is really, you got to touch the emotion, but mm. what, what really is the emotion about, right? How to touch the emotion, telling the personal stories, individual stories. That goes back to what we did in our episode that we illustrated the different the different types of uh, generations here even among the same generation there are very different types of culture um young people culture here so uh that's probably will generate that probably will generate new type of stories right this story that i from my observation most recently there are a lot of uh, media documentaries or films coming out telling you know, reflecting on, for example, parents' love for children here. And um, it's kind of a more reflective than ever before. So I think that's also kind of storytelling. And yeah. as for how we can integrate that with the international understanding or international uh, approaches or method um, to to meet the, uh, the, the possibilities uh, for the Western audience to understand would also mm. be something significant for you know for future bridge builders i guess mm. yeah yeah no that's true that's true yeah so ah uh, well this is awesome uh, one more one more question that i have um i'll leave to brendan probably have a few more questions but uh, this is really really um wonderful you know conversation that i want to you know treasure particularly I would like to know, um, you know, at this particular moment, in, this is 2019, we are hearing all kinds of different messages from, you know, both China, Chinese audience and also all over the world, people from all over the world, to look for the perspectives in 2019, what to really look for when it comes to, you know, building bridges and break basic wall. There's a lot of barriers for us to move forward, but I guess a lot of bridge building opportunities. So Professor uh, Brown, if you could uh, give us any, share any particular knowledge or expertise or story that um, you could like to say, what would be the best way to motivate our um, um, young Chinese people going global and to, to be better to you know, to have more confidence at this moment to present themselves? Well, I guess it's to make them aware of the things that we've been talking about, that they're part of a, you know, enormously important and significant story, a trend which is going to change the world. I mean, it's it's not going to happen overnight, but it's going to have a very, very significant impact on the next century i mean if you've in the space of uh really 20 years because although chinese students did start to come abroad in the early 80s uh in small numbers to be absolutely honest until the late 1990s mm -hmm. it wasn't a huge number i think in britain in 1999 there were probably 2000 chinese students in the uk and now there are something like 130,000 so you know and that's been the case <clears throat> for the last 5 or 10 years so the real floodgates kind of started in the 2000s. So we really are at the beginning of this transformative kind of sort of change, basically. And it's an exciting story, but it's also one where the punchline hasn't been delivered yet. And mm -hmm. I guess Chinese students have got to kind of realize that they're the ones that are going to deliver the punchline, right? I, I mean, they're the ones telling the story. Uh, we're yeah. watching. Um, and they're, 
often feeling that they're not that powerful, that they're just sort of coming and working like hell abroad and, you know, kind of they don't feel like they've got huge status because they're often you – know, I, I, and I, I think it's, um, uh, it's true that universities all too often eh, everywhere – talk about Chinese students like they're just a kind of, you know, source of fees. And that is a terrible message to kind of feel that you're part of, you you know, that you're just this source of huge numbers of fees. Whereas, in fact, the really significance is, is going to be this enormous contribution as a bridge to this group mate. And the fact that it's not an obvious, um, it's not an obvious kind of punchline that they're going to give. You know, this is not going to be a punchline where we suddenly get a, a, you know, kind of highly regimented, politically very obedient group of, you know, supporters mm-hmm. for their home country. I mean, right. uh, no, I don't think that's going to. So this so. is not a punchline. Um, this is not a punchline that I think the Chinese government are, are going to find an easy one. But it's not a punchline that we're going to find very easy because I think they're going to basically um, produce a very different sort of view of the world um mm-hmm. which is truly high but i mean in a sense the things we've talked about of the differences in value systems the differences mm-hmm. in outlook chinese students are at the forefront of that they're the ones that most intimately engage with western views um they internalize them but they don't slavishly follow them mm-hmm. and that's yeah. where it's exciting you know this is something that is new for everyone that you've got Mm -hmm. a group of global citizens who are hybrid, who are very Chinese, but also very international, uh, Mm -hmm. who are not, don't fit into some obvious hole. They've never really existed before. So Mm -hmm. it's an incredible, exciting story. In terms of the people on the other side, the, the the non-Chinese, the people who are going to be integrating the young people who are from Britain or from America, or from other countries who are seeing the rise of China and they're seeing their Chinese cohort, um, you know, dealing with their new position in the world. What, what do you, what's the narrative that you explain to Westerners about how to understand this moment in China that they're going through? Cause it's kind of a birth pain in a way, I think. Well, to me, it's a moment of liberation for them too, because it opens up a whole new vista or whole new attitude that wasn't there before and it's accessible now it's not something they have to go very far to experience there are chinese in their environment there are people they can make friends with there is an you know ability to kind of engage with china it certainly didn't exist for me in the mid 1990s or early 1990s when i started to try and understand china when i was um studying chinese in london in 93 to 94 going to see a Chinese film was really difficult. I mean, there were one or two cinemas that from time to time showed the latest uh, Jiang Yi Mo or Chiang Kai Ge film, and it mm-hmm. wasn't easy to get uh, access. Uh, it wasn't easy to get even things like the Far East Economic Review. I mean, it no longer exists, but that was the main source of news about what was happening in China. The internet didn't exist at that time, or not very widely, and so we didn't really have ease of access now of course it's totally different so china is accessible and for british students my plea is whatever discipline area they're in you know they should understand that china is not just a geography it's a kind of intellectual tradition and it's a very different kind of um, view of the world that they would probably find rewarding to engage with and to go now uh, many i mean the british council and others do excellent courses i think it's called generation uk where they support um, people going to china and studying um and having a few months there you know the americans have given a lot of support to having young americans go to china mm-hmm. it's now time for us to start our kind of re- sort of re- uh, reply in a way i mean all these young chinese have come to europe that's fantastic mm-hmm. but now we have to get it off our backsides and actually say okay we'd better go and have a look at what's happening there and yep. when that happens in the sort of numbers, I, mean, I don't think it'll happen quite as huge as it's happened in China, but it will probably happen you know, more and more. Uh, then we really have something exciting because we have a group of young British or European uh, students and a group of young Chinese students who are very knowledgeable about each other. And mm-hmm. you know what happens then? Um, right. They either have a richer and deeper dialogue or... They discover big, big differences and they have to work them out. But something happens. I mean, you know, it's not just a passive process. 
Thank you, Professor Brown. Very, very valuable insights. Um, planting new seeds and more, I'd like to say, new um, prospects and new seeds for more possibilities. This is a very good beginning for 2019 for every one of us. Thank you. Well, very good to speak to you both. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, then. Cheers, Sam. Bye. <laughs> Well, thank you to Ying and to Professor Carrie Brown for joining us today. And she was right. I do have a few things to say. Um, first of all, on a very Monday note, the reason that um, last week's show sounded the way it did is because I had a pretty wicked cold. So I won't say too much right now as I'm getting my voice back. But the more meaningful part of what struck me after listening to this was that the future people live depends on the stories they tell themselves or what they believe in now. And Professor Brown really underlined this in a lot of ways to me. And I just think it was a very thoughtful chat. And he had a line that struck with me, um, this extraordinary moment in China relations right now. And maybe the most telling part of this whole interview for me was that many of these topics and things we sort of touched on today were what regular listeners of the show and our friends tell us privately they care about the most. So we hope you're enjoying it. Please let us know what you think of the show. Visit us via any of the social media where you can find us or visit us via the contact page on the website, the resources or feedback link. You can find us many ways. Let us know what you would like us to talk about or to cover. And if you have any ideas for future guests on the show, we are all ears. Thank you again to Professor Brown. We look forward to having him back on in the future. And thanks again. And we will see you next week on How China works.